right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Chase Murphy. I'm a tax partner at Baker Tilly, uh, national CPA firm. I lead our entrepreneurship tax practice, uh, work with entrepreneurs of all shapes and sizes, uh, certainly with the entrepreneurial community that is physicians, uh, work heavily within the healthcare space, uh, supporting tax advisory and, and strategy work uh, for physicians of all shapes and sizes. So excited to be here today. Uh, hopefully get some value. We'll be covering some stuff at a super high level. Uh, I candidly could spend an hour talking on any one of these topics independently. Uh, so I'll try to give you some uh, helpful tidbits at a high level, but always happy to connect and help answer any questions more formally. Uh, my contact information will be on the last slide uh, and you'll see the QR code throughout with uh, links to my LinkedIn as well. So with that, we've got tax accounting tips and tricks for physicians and we'll jump right in. Today's high level agenda, we'll talk a little bit about strategic tax planning opportunities, uh, particularly around entity structuring, understanding the separation of a real estate and practice, which is common uh, for independent practices, uh, a little bit about retirement planning and estate planning, uh, and then we'll segue into some best practices around uh, accounting and finance infrastructure. So jumping right in, uh, you know, items to consider, we'll dig into each one of these in a, a little bit better detail, but, um, you know, the foundational starting point for tax planning and, and, all, and all considerations really starts with the entity type and ensuring that you're in the right corporate structure to accomplish uh, the goals and to do so uh, from an efficient perspective on the tax side of things. We'll chat briefly about the difference between accrual versus cash methodology of reporting. Um, won't really touch much on the restructuring, but there'll be a slide in there you can reference if, if helpful at some point in time. Uh, state presence, likely a little less impactful, uh, particularly given the geographic presence of most healthcare practices, but to the extent you are practicing in in multiple states uh, are crossing over borders. I uh, just wanted to, to, to put some tidbit in the back of your mind there. Uh, and then we'll kind of carve off with retirement planning and estate planning. So in hitting the foundational piece, entity types uh, from a tax perspective in the United States, the IRS has two primary uh, entity structures that most would deploy, uh, a C corporation or what we call flow through entities, uh, namely S corporations and partnerships. Uh, in the healthcare practitioner space, uh, most always you're in, a, in an S-corp structure with regards to the practice, both from a licensure standpoint and a tax efficiency. So in a privately held, closely held business, S-corporations provide some benefits with uh, the, the most effective uh, tax rate. So it mitigates self-employment taxes is the short answer there. Uh, in partnerships, all income or loss passing through to the owners is subject to self-employment tax to the extent that you're active in the business. Uh, in a healthcare capacity as a practicing physician, you're most certainly active. And so most deploy what we call an S corporation, which still allows you to pass through the, the profits of the company to yourself personally, uh, benefit from that single layer of tax at the individual level. But so long as you pay yourself a reasonable wage, you have an opportunity uh, to take some excess profits out of the business, not subject to self-employment taxes, which, which saves you on some arbitrage. Um, we'll also touch briefly on a common structure for those that may be purchasing and deploying real estate around a private practice. Uh, and that general rule of thumb is you would typically not want to commingle any potentially appreciating real estate assets uh, with the practice, both from a, a tax perspective, um, but also even from a risk mitigation perspective. So I'll cover that briefly on the next slide. Again, C corporations uncommon in this situation. Wanted to leave it on the slide as I, I do present similar capacity to other entrepreneurs. Uh, C corporations uh, have a, a certain place in time that makes sense. Um, they are subject to what we call a double layer of tax. So the corporation pays a tax and then any owners or shareholders would pay a second dividend tax to the extent you're distributing profits. So as a general rule of thumb in a healthcare capacity, they don't often make sense. Typically you see C corporations more so in a, in a conduit of an entity that's raising outside capital. And there's some uh, administrative efficiencies that come with that. So I'll skip on ahead. Um, wanted to put this illustration out as a, a common structure that we see. Uh, the circles at the top represent uh, an individual position owning entities. Uh, on the left, you'll see a common practice structure. So as I've mentioned, practices are most commonly in S corporations, uh, partially, partially from a licensing standpoint, but also from the benefit of that self-employment savings at the individual level. Again, Profits from the practice are going to be taxed at the individual level regardless, but in an S-corp capacity, there's an opportunity to mitigate some of the self-employment taxes that would otherwise be present in a partnership. On the right side of the screen, you see that same position owning a separate LLC 
that would contain real estate. And so, you know, in most private practices, uh, um, physicians being as entrepreneurial as they are, one of the wealth building strategies is to acquire and own the real estate that may house the private practice. Uh, we have seen in the in the past where at times that real estate will be commingled uh, within the S corp of the practice itself. Um, bad answer for two primary reasons. One, again, practicing in a, a potentially high risk environment, you're potentially subjecting the value of your real estate to the practice to the extent there's ever an issue from a litigation standpoint. Um, but more so, now again, I'll keep this at a very high level. We could talk for ten minutes about it, but. In an S corp, to the extent you have appreciating property, which we all hope our real estate appreciates over time, there can be issues trying to separate that in the future. If you were to ever try to sell the practice, as an example, but want to maintain that real estate, to pull the real estate out of the S corp at any point in time, uh, it would be treated as if you sold it to yourself at fair market value, which creates a taxable event without any cash. Very bad answer. So, for a number of reasons, uh, in the case that you were to look to be acquiring real estate for your practice or otherwise, we'd always encourage those being separate entities. And then real estate's always, um, you know, suggested to be held in a traditional LLC, which is either disregarded for tax to the extent it's owned by one individual, or if you're partnering with other physicians or other partners to own that real estate, uh, it by default becomes a partnership. In both cases, the income or loss associated with those activities is passed up to the individual level aggregated with all other activities, um, and then inevitably the, the tax consequences paid at the individual level. The one last thing I would mention is that anytime you start to deal with investment activities around real estate, you have what we call active versus passive considerations for tax purposes. And in most cases, if you're not a real estate professional and you're a practicing physician, losses from that real estate end up being suspended in what we call a passive situation. There's a special rule when that real estate houses an active trader business. So in this case, if you acquire real estate that is primary function is to house your, your medical practice. There's an opportunity to kind of mash those together and consider your real estate an active trader business as well, in which case those losses can be used to offset income uh, from your practice. Cruel, cruel versus cash methodology. Again, I'll hit the next handful of slides at a very high level. Always happy to revert back and answer questions. But general rule of thumb for companies with less than 25 million of revenue, from a tax standpoint, you have an option to report on either a cash or an accrual basis. And the main thing to think about in the healthcare capacity when determining whether to report on a cash or accrual basis is that to the extent you're allowed to report on cash, your tax consequence will always correlate to the actual cash economics of the business. Um, given the nature of healthcare and the likelihood of aging accruals or receivables, um, to the extent that you're required to file on an accrual basis, you can get into a situation where you're taxed on what we would call phantom income, which would mean to the extent you have receivables that exist at year end that have not yet been collected, you're still taxed on those receivables, uh, which again creates that phantom tax consequence without any cash. So when possible, report on a cash basis. I'll touch on it in a bit, but your tax reporting methodology and your financial statement methodology do not have to be the same. So part of what we do is we take at times accrual based financial statements, convert them to a cash basis for purposes of tax reporting. So very high level, uh, but wanted to paint that picture. And I'll gleam over this restructuring. Um, there's a whole other set of nuanced issues to the extent you're issuing shares or units or compensatory shares, et cetera, less common in a healthcare capacity. And that particularly for the practice, it's typically limited to being owned by the licensed physician. And so oftentimes you're not issuing things like compensatory units and things to employees, but uh, always happy to answer questions if there's thoughts or, or issues around that. Again, we'll also touch on this at a very high level, um, but um, there's oftentimes a misconception in business that says my tax obligations or reporting obligations are limited to my home state or my state of domicile. And so just wanted to note for those that may be traveling physicians or uh, serving clients uh, or patients in states outside of your home state, or to the extent you start to hire virtual back office support or administrative support that may be residing in a state outside of your home state, uh, that you could be creating what we call nexus, which long and short is just a requirement to potentially file tax returns and or pay taxes at a state level. Uh, and that is all determined based on your footprint uh, that we would call it, which is effectively where you have sales, where you have property or where you have payroll. And so just note that 
regardless of where you're domiciled or where the entity is registered. If you have economic activity coming from outside your home state, just be mindful of whether or not you're creating filing obligations. And as a quick extension to that, and some of this not as applicable in healthcare capacity, but there are several different items to consider when you start talking about state taxes. Those include income taxes, which are self-explanatory, sales taxes to the extent that you are selling uh, goods and to some extent services outside your state. So if you're shipping creams or uh, other sort of topicals or other sorts of things that may be associated or complementary to your practice, just again, be mindful of whether you're creating a, a sales tax obligation uh, and then other withholding and local taxes that may be applicable depending upon the nature of your business. So just things to kind of keep in mind. Um, we'll spend a, a couple of minutes on these next two slides to kind of round out, again, very high level tax planning. I could spend an hour in and of itself just talking about tax planning, um, but really the silver bullet of, 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 of tax planning opportunities comes when you start talking about retirement planning. So in general, when you incur expenses for your business, you're effectively spending a dollar to save 30 cents in tax or whatever your effective tax rate is. And so when I talk to clients about how can I minimize my tax bill, can I go out and buy a new vehicle for my practice, or can I go out and uh, incur uh, additional inventory or bonus my employees, all these different things that do result in deductions for your business and reduce your tax bill, but you spend that dollar to save 30 cents. And so there's always a discussion on what other accretive value are you getting out of that 70 cents on the dollar that is coming out of pocket. If there's not a creative value, which means you're building uh, brand loyalty with your employees or you're allowing yourself to expand business operations, you've bought new office space or you've leased additional space, you bought new equipment, does that new equipment allow you to generate additional revenue? If not, then inevitably you're better off paying the $30 in tax and keeping your other $70 uh, for personal use. That said, and I caveat all that with retirement planning being that silver bullet to some extent. And so one of the paramount things that we work with, particularly in a physician practice, is understanding what opportunities there are to deploy some level of retirement planning. And this will be very high level in that you could have a comp and benefits person also spend an entire hour going through all the nuanced differences of different types of plans. Um, but at a high level, uh, if, if deployed correctly, a retirement planning vehicle would allow you to contribute different amounts based on the type of plan into a retirement account for your benefit in the future, and at the same time, create a tax savings today. Not in all cases, but in many cases. There's differences between what they call defined contributions versus defined benefit plans. And those come with different levels of both participation requirements, potentially for other employees, uh, and different levels of the maximum amount allowed to be contributed. Um, so on the on the low end and kind of, I would say, more traditional end, you've got basic 401ks or so, solo 401ks, IRAs, um, different types of contribution plans that have typically lower limits um, on the defined benefit plan end of the spectrum. Um, you've got things like cash balance plans and others that as profitability of the business increases potentially meaningfully. And as you've got excess profits within the business above and beyond what you need to live off of. There's opportunities to look at some of these more sophisticated plans, which have at times much higher limits on what can be contributed, uh, which in turn further reduces the tax bill today and allows you to sock away additional money in the long term for retirement. So we highly encourage to the extent you're setting up a practice or you actively have a practice with excess profits. If you don't have a retirement plan, we highly encourage you to chat with a, a comp and benefits person. I'm certainly happy to answer questions. Uh, but that's one of the most productive tax planning strategies to start with. Um, and again, it's a, it's kind of the silver bullet. Um, we'll touch briefly on life insurance. Uh, you know, obviously this kind of parlays into the estate planning slide on the, on the next tab here, um, but primarily two different types of life insurance, term versus perm, our whole life. Um, I myself have a meaningful amount of both term and perm life insurance. I uh, would highly encourage if you don't have life insurance, particularly if you start to have an estate discussion or uh, family dynamics, uh, spouse, children, et cetera, protecting that, um, certainly knowing that the compensation or the earning potential for your physician practice, if something were to happen, you, should, you just want to make sure that you're properly um, proper, properly mitigated from a life insurance standpoint. So again, estate tax, we'd also spend an entire hour talking about only estate tax, so I'll keep this super high level. Um, but inevitably, both from an asset protection standpoint and potentially a, an estate tax mitigation when you inevitably pass, 
um, you know, making sure that you're conscientious, chat with an estate attorney and, and look at what options might exist to fit your specific circumstance. There is not a one size fits all of this is what exactly everyone should do from an estate planning standpoint. It oftentimes determined, it's oftentimes determined based on what is your earning power? What do you, ex what's your expected net worth uh, at some point in time over your life? Uh, what are your goals, both from a philanthropic standpoint and or legacy? Um, there's lots of different types of trusts and tools to be used to, to mitigate both an estate tax when you pass and transition wealth to the next generation and or to phil philanthropic endeavors, um, but also a component of asset protection that exists, again, um, heightened in a higher risk profile of certain types of physician practices. So again, would, would highly encourage you to chat with an estate attorney. Most commonly, just kind of the, the basic uh, foundation of the initial estate plan, family revocable trust, which allows you to um, more so limit probate issues if there were to be something to happen. I'm not a state attorney. Uh, I leverage some of these things myself personally, but basic uh, a basic component of even having your primary residence into a revocable trust uh, would allow your family or your heirs to minimize some of the probate hassles that may come if and when you pass. Uh, and does provide some level of protection there as well. Uh, a basic pour over will that is able to determine and govern what you want to happen with your assets if something were to happen to you uh, and to a surviving spouse. Basic things like medical power of attorney, child guardian, financial roles, all important to have in place and to have well documented uh, in the uh, adverse situation that something were to happen to you, just to make sure your family and your assets uh, are protected. Nothing worse than having a successful career and uh, building a, a healthy amount of assets only to have those tied up into probate or to fall into hands of folks that were not aligned with your intentions or your, your goals from a legacy standpoint. So um, with that, we won't touch on R&D credits, but to the extent you're in, in the research field, um, there's opportunities to take income tax credits to the extent you're developing some sort of new or improved product or process. It's technological in nature. You might say we're physicians, we're not uh, te technical developers. Um, that's defined as anything rooted in science. So to the extent you're developing some sort of new life science or some sort of new uh, pharmaceutical treatment or otherwise, uh, just plant in the back of your mind if you're in a research capacity or that's complementary to your practice, there are opportunities to explore uh, taking an R&D credit, which is a dollar for dollar reduction of tax, just like the deduction, which is again a 30 cents on the dollar, depending on your effective tax rate. So we'll skip over that and we'll transition quickly for the last maybe five minutes or so into accounting best practices. So um, again, foundationally, the, the most helpful component of an effective tax planning strategy and an effective compliance from a tax reporting perspective is a healthy, uh, a healthy set of financial statements. Uh, the starting point for all tax return preparation really lies in the financial statements of the business. Uh, it's also impactful and, and really critical in terms of understanding the, the performance of your business. Uh, and there's a lot of different tools that exist out there today to simplify that process through automation and just proper leveraging of the tools that exist. So again, I will skip over most of this stuff at a very high level, but fun fundamentally it really starts with the general ledger software and then understanding what types of financial reporting may be required depending upon how they're going to be used or who the user of those financial statements might be. There's some best practices around customer invoicing or vendor bill pay, uh, and then inevitably uh, uh, regulated compliance around payroll reporting and or 1099 reporting anytime you're paying for, for services and particularly employing resources. So again, jumping right in at a very high level, general ledger software is what type of accounting software you're using to track your financial data. Um, we see everything from uh, an Excel and a bank account uh, that's on the, the um, I'd say on the, the one end of the spectrum, all the way to more sophisticated accounting platforms like Sage Intact and otherwise. Most commonly in a, in a medical practice, a, a good QuickBooks Online is, uh, is sufficient and has plenty of functionality to be able to adequately track your financial performance and do so in an efficient way. Making sure that you've got the proper chart of accounts is step one. You don't want to be overkill, but you want to make sure that you've got accounts that make sense and that you understand what those accounts are so that you can interpret that information and make decisions about the business. Leveraging automation and integrations, great tools out there, again, to limit the amount of effort that either yourself or a bookkeeper or an accountant are having to do to manage this. Um, and then making sure that you've got good reconciliation practices, preferably on a monthly basis, just to ensure that your bank accounts and your credit cards are capturing all the activity. 
financial reports. So kind of one piece of it's what are they used for at, at a minimum tax return preparation and accurate tax reporting management. So understanding the health of your business to the extent that third parties are relying upon it. So if you've got bankers or auditors that, that may be relying upon your financial statements, there's an added level of sophistication and reporting requirements on what we call GAAP. We'll ignore that for now. Touched on it briefly earlier, cash versus accrual. Cash is a very um, kind of unsophisticated level of financial reporting. You're just reconciling cash uh, on a monthly basis or annual basis. Most folks move into more of a modified accrual where you're able to better track uh, payables, receivables, uh, vendor payments, et cetera. Uh, the accrual method gives you a more accurate picture of the actual economics of the business as opposed to just month over month cash. Mm -hmm. um, lots of functions that you can do in terms of creating different classes or locations. So to the extent you have multiple locations within your practice and you want to kind of see how each of them are performing independently, there's functionality to create different location tracking within QuickBooks Online or otherwise, uh, and then being able to adequately budget and again, understand the performance of the business. So uh, I'm going to skip through most of this at a really high level. I kind of painted the initial, um, the initial picture there for you, but again, financial reports should provide clear picture of the company's performance. Uh, you can understand KPI or key performance indicators that understand where am I getting the most economic value? Where do I need to potentially revisit my process? Um, but financials should tell you a picture, not just track information to file a tax return. They should help you manage your business. Um, understand where the money goes, understand the driving factors of where you're making or losing money and be able to be strategic about what that means for your business and how you might wanna, um, how you might wanna address those things. Um, again, very high level processes, have efficient processes, be consistent about it. It really eliminates headaches in the long term, and it sets you up to be able to focus on what you do best, which is providing great quality care for your patients. Uh, but just wanted to note that there's a lot of resources out there for automation around customer invoicing, setting up invoice templates, helping manage collections. From a vendor bill pay standpoint, we oftentimes leverage what we call bill.com. Uh, it is a online repository for vendors to submit invoices. Uh, you get a nice report. You can approve those transactions. They get paid automatically, and then they get automatically coded to the appropriate ledger within your financial statements. And then the last couple of things I would point on is just to echo that um, to the extent you're paying for uh, vendors for services or rent, um, pay more than $600 a year, there's generally a requirement that you file 1099 forms. The important thing to note there is that the submission of 1099 forms and or W-2s for employees is what solidifies your ability to take deductions for those items. And this goes back to the IRS's intention of creating a balanced ecosystem and that by issuing a 1099 or a W-2, the recipient is now obligated to recognize income on that for tax purposes, which again preserves your right to be able to take a deduction. To the extent you're not compliant issuing 1099s or W-2s, those deductions could come to challenge um, and you certainly do not want that. Those are typically due by January 31 of each year following the payment. Uh, again, very high level. There's lots of resources out there to help manage payroll. Payroll can be a bit of a hassle and you certainly want to create a, an efficient process on the front end. There's lots of things like Intuit Elite, Gusto, ADP, Paychecks that can manage that for you. I promise it's money well spent. Um, there's lots of nuance to the application of withholdings and, and requirements around payroll reporting uh, that I would encourage you not try to tackle yourself uh, and just outsource that to the relevant folks. So with that, uh, we are about at time. Again, Chase Murphy, I'm a partner at Baker Tilly, national CPA firm, lead our entrepreneurship practice, uh, love working with entrepreneurial minded folks, trying to get creative, understand how to build wealth be intentional around planning to mitigate tax both today and in the future. Uh, always happy to connect and answer any questions. My email contacts here, also a QR code to my LinkedIn. Uh, always happy to answer questions and be a resource. And thank you so much uh, for having me today uh, and look forward to hopefully connecting with everybody in the future. Thanks. Yeah.